for some time now, we've been looking at obedience. Obedience. So we've looked at what is obedience, the blessings of obedience. So we want to move one step ahead. So we want to look at what is titled um, living in presumption. Living in presumption. Um, well, the first thing we probably want to ask ourselves is what is presumption? Uh, okay. Shall we pray, please? Our God and our Father, we thank you for your presence that is already here. Lord, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us this morning. Let your word be expressly made known to us. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Give us a heart that is ready to obey your word. To please you and to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we want to look at um, living in presumption. Uh, the first thing we probably want to ask ourselves is what is presumption? What is presumption? Uh, if you check any good dictionary, the word presume means to take for granted or to act impenitently or to take the liberty of something or to take advantage of somebody, maybe somebody's kindness or somebody's uh, goodness. So, when you use the word presumably, it's the same thing as saying probability. Presumption, which is a noun, means something that is supposed or a strong likelihood, something, a strong likelihood that, that there is something or a strong likelihood about an event. So, presumption means to take or to suppose to be true. Or entitled to a belief without examination. Okay, to entitled to a belief without examination. To take or to suppose to be true. That is presumption. So you have a belief without a proof. Or on the strength of probability. So it simply means to take for granted, to infer, to suppose, or to assume. So all that shades of meaning is what is a presumption. We are going to look at two Bible, two scriptures. We will read from, first we will read from Numbers chapter 14. The, you can read the entire chapter. It's a story we are familiar with. It's about the children of Israel. Moses sent 12 spies to go and spy out the land of Canaan. So they came. Ten of them came with an evil report except for Caleb and Joshua. You know who gave a good report. So we won't read all of it, but we'll just take it from verse 39. 39 to 45. Then it's a joyful night! Let's scream! And the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountain top. Nevertheless, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Homer. Uh, what happened here is that after the people, after the, uh, the, the, the 10 spies, sorry, after 10 of these 12 spies, you know, told them that, look, we went to the promised land, the land is actually flowing with milk and honey, and that 
the fruit of it is good. They even brought something and then went ahead and said, look, we saw the children of the Anakite there, that is giants, and then their city is well fortified. We cannot go up to those people. We were like grasshopper before them. You know, and in our eyes, you know, we are like grasshopper. So we cannot attack them. And then uh, all the people started to wail. They were discouraged. And then except Caleb and uh, Joshua who said, no, let us go up. Their defense is not, you know, the Lord is with us. We are able to defeat them. And the Bible said the people wanted to stone Joshua and uh, Caleb. Then the glory of the Lord appeared. And of course, God said he was going to destroy all of them. But Moses pleaded and said, look, what will the people say? That you could not defend them. You could not bring them into the land you promised. That's why you destroyed them in the wilderness. Then God said in verse 28 of Numbers 14 that, look, as you have said in my ears, cried into my ears, that is what I am going to do. And then God made a pronouncement that, look, any person who is 20 years and above will not enter the land of Canaan. But these are your children that you say that will be destroyed. They are the ones that went. And then God told Moses, now, round about, just go by the way you came towards, you know, so, like we were told last week, instead of spending 40 days to cross, in fact, they were really at the verge of crossing into the land of Canaan. They had to go back, and for every year, sorry, for every, every, every uh, day, they had to spend a year. And what did God do? God simply eliminated all those who were 20 years and above, so that it was only the children that eventually entered the land of Canaan. Now, the people now said, ah, we have, uh, we have sinned. Oh, we have not, we have not done well. They regretted their actions. They regretted their actions. So they came to Moses. The following morning, they got up. They said, look, we are going. We are going to the mountain. We are going to attack the people. And Moses said, look, don't go. In fact, God, if you read it, God told them, tell them not to go. The same account is repeated in Joshua chapter 1 from verse 34, 36 down to 42, 43. Don't go. But the people will not listen. And the Bible said here, verse 44, but they presumed to go up to the mountain. So they assumed that they will go. That look, we will defeat them. But Moses said, don't go. The Amalekites are there. The Canaanites are there. And truly the people came and they pursued them. In fact, they killed many of them. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 43 and 44, you will find what I'm saying there. So they actually killed them and they died. So we find that these people brought disaster upon themselves. So they assumed they were living in presumption. Or rather, they presumed that the Lord was with them. So they went in their presumption, they went up, and they were destroyed, and they were sent back. Many of them were killed, you know, and they came back, and they cried before the Lord, but the Lord did not answer them because they had disobeyed the Lord. The Lord said, go, you know, into the land of Canaan. They refused to go. And when God said, don't go, they chose to go. And of course, they were defeated. The other story, which is very pathetic, which we'll quickly look at, it's in Judges. We know the story of Samson. Judges chapter 16. Again, you can take time to read all of it. Judges chapter 16. Uh, permit me, let's read the longer scripture. I'll read from verse 4. I'll try to be fast. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where is your great strength, where your great strength lies, and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dry, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried. She bound him with them. 
Now the men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, something. But he broke the bowstring as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please let me tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into a web of, of the loom. So she wove it tightly with button of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he woke from his sleep and pulled out the button and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she persisted, sorry, when she pestered him daily with her words and prayed him so that his soul was vexed that he told her all his heart and said to her no razor has ever come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb if I'm shaven then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak but sorry I shall become weak and be like any other man when Delilah saw that he has told her all his heart she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lured him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave up the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And he said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from, from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Praise the Lord. So we know the story of Sam. It's very pathetic when you read this story. Well, you know, my wonder is, I keep wondering, how come that, how come that something just could not see through this woman? Eh? Delilah, of course, had honey in her lips as it were but her heart is full of poison she wanted money from the loss of the Philistines and they promised they were going to give her 1100 11, uh, pieces of silver each of the Philistines uh, rulers of the, their five, uh, their, their, their five uh, divisions or cities rather you know so I wonder why why couldn't he at the first time you told her and then suddenly she said the feelings are upon you the second time and then the third time so I can't understand you know so it's uh, such a tragic statement in the Old Testament that he did not know that his strength has left him he did not know that God had left him so the truth is that the strength of uh, Samson lies in his consecration to God lies in his consecration to God so it was God himself who was the strength of his who was the source of his strength so something sold out you know on the lap of a of, of, of a harlot sorry for using that word on the lap of a Delilah you know he was unaware that he had betrayed his calling 
So he permitted the Philistine woman to rob him of the sign of his uh, consecration to the Lord. So as it were, the Lord's champion, who was supposed to oppress and to deal decisively with the Philistines, he became helpless. He was asleep in the arms of uh, his lover. And then, I wonder how they should, you know, his head was shaved. He got all the seven locks and the man did not wake up. It's, it's terrible. You can't understand. So the devil allowed him to get into a deep sleep. So, my brother, my sister, it's a terrible thing. So we saw here that Samson did not know. He thought that he still had power. So he presumed that his power was still, uh, his strength was still with him. But his strength has left him. God has left him. You know, God has left him. So we find that Samson lived in disobedience. He lived in disobedience. And because he lived in disobedience, he wallowed in a presumption. He presumed, he assumed, you know, he talked, he took for granted the strength that God gave to him. So he let out everything. And what happened? Samson became uh, humiliated. If you read further, the Philistines, the, the loves of the Philistines came to him. They took him away, got out his hand, and they made him to start grinding grain. You know, to start grinding grain. So they actually humiliated him. So when you walk in, 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 in presumption, when you live in presumption, what happens is that one, you will not please God. And secondly, you will end up in um, humiliation. You will end up being ashamed. Disgrace and humiliation will come upon uh, that individual. So it's such a terrible thing. So living in a presumption is also living in disobedience to God to, to some extent. Now we are going to look at how we can avoid living in disobedience. Living in presumption is for us to know God and to believe God and obey Him. Obey the Lord. Know what is the mind and the will of God for us and be ready to do it. And more importantly, we should learn to exercise faith. Faith, not in things. Not in things, but rather in the word of God. So the way we can overcome living in presumption is to exercise faith in the word of God rather than in human beings or in things or in material things. But our faith and our trust should be in God. Once we do that, then we'll be able to live above presumption. We'll probably look at some areas, you know, where people usually live in presumption. Uh, one area, it's uh, the area of uh, okay, well, medication. You know, sometimes you wonder, should I take medication or not? There is nothing wrong with taking medication. No? I think we should say that straight away from here. Uh, going to see a doctor or taking pills or taking medicine, there is nothing wrong with it. There is nothing. The doctors are not against divine healing. They are not at all. So, divine healing, one thing we need to know about divine healing is that all divine healing are not necessarily instantaneous. It can be gradual. We saw an example in Luke. Jesus Christ made people and look, put in somebody's eyes and asked, what do you see? And the man said he saw men like trees. He didn't see clearly. And then he had a second touch and he saw clearly. So, divine healing sometimes is not instantaneous. It is progressive. It is gradual. So, between the time you prayed and the time that God will heal you, God makes that healing permanent. You know, God makes a physical manifestation of that healing. Between that time, what do you do? So, if you take drugs to assist you, it is, not, it is not a sin. But you could also decide on your own by yourself and say, God, I believe your word that by your stripe, by his stripes, I am healed. That Jesus Christ took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses and diseases. You know, and you say, by his stripe, I am healed. God, I want you to heal me by yourself. That is a personal decision which you have made. And then you can trust God to do that. So you go through all the pain and all of that. And if God sees your heart, God can heal you. You know, without having to take, but there's nothing wrong with taking a medication. In the 80s, 
and perhaps in the 70s. There are instances of people who came out for prayers, they were prayed for, you know, and they threw away their glasses. Some even crushed the glass. They are reading their glasses and they couldn't see. So you, you wonder what has happened. Now, the person is living in presumption. He is living on assumption. He is taking God for granted. You know? There is the faith, faith fact and there is also the physical fact. So at the time you were prayed for, at the time you prayed, it is a faith fact that God has healed you. But the manifestation has not come yet. So the manifestation has to come, the physical manifestation. So for somebody who is using glasses, you keep on using the glass and you believe God that you are healed. And what happens when God actually heals you, when the physical manifestation comes, you won't even see well with the glass. You should by yourself that will remove the glass. And you begin to see very well. So the truth is that wearing glasses or not wearing glasses has nothing to do with healing of the eyes. No, honestly, it has nothing to do with healing of the eyes. Uh, if you need to use glasses to assist you to see properly, then for God's sake, go ahead and use it. But that somebody is using glass does not mean that the person cannot believe God for healing. So, it simply means that for that individual, his faith was based on not using glasses and not on the word of God. So the Bible says in Hebrews 1, it's Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is giving substance to what we have hoped for, the evidence of what is not seen. So, the evidence that God has healed you is the word of God. And that is a fake fact. But a time will come when you will have the physical manifestation. And at that time, you won't need to use the glass yourself. Praise the Lord. So it's the same thing like somebody who is on a wheelchair. You know, I was told of a brother. Actually, you know, a brother is not a medical. He took a patient. They went to a, a, a meeting, a meeting like this, you know, and believed God that the brother will be healed. And people, said, some persons who knew him were afraid. So my brother, a man who is on a wheelchair, yes, you have been prayed for. You believe that you are healed. Based on the evidence of the word of God, you are healed. But the physical fact is yet to manifest. The man who is on a wheelchair, when he get, when he's healed, he will get up by himself. He will jump up by himself. When the physical manifestation comes, he will jump up by himself. So my brother, in that area you find that people are living in a presumption. Praise the Lord. Another area it's, uh, you know, sometimes you wonder. Uh, insurance people come to you. Come and take insurance. Come and take insurance. Life insurance and all that. It's okay. I'm a Christian. Ah, God is my insurance. The blood of Jesus is my insurance. I mean, it's good. That is good. That's fact. That's, that's, that's Bible. But the truth is that when you take insurance or not taking insurance is not what prevents whatever is going to happen not to happen. For example, car insurance. Government insists that you have a car insurance. And having a car insurance is really for your own good. If you have a comprehensive insurance, it's for your own good. If you hit somebody or somebody hits you, you know, the insurance will take over and they will bear the expense. So depending on the type you do, whether it's third party or if it's comprehensive, then they take. But the thing is that whether you take the insurance or you don't take insurance, it will not prevent what is going to happen not to happen. The only thing is that it will save you from, you know, spending as much as you would have spent. Because the insurance will take it over. So it gives you some level of um, security. You know, it gives you some level of security. And the truth is that, my brethren, we are not perfect. And we live in an environment that is imperfect. And the people all around us are imperfect. You can be careful driving your car. The man who is coming behind you may receive a call. And suddenly he brings out his phone. And before you know it, he is you behind. You see, it's, 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 it's a problem. You were being careful yourself. 
and then suddenly somebody has hit you and then the man comes and starts pleading and all that. Or you could even make a mistake, you mistakenly hit somebody and the man says, look, you are going to do this, you are going to repair my car. No, if you have insurance, you can take it over. Your insurance company can take it over. Praise the Lord. So our faith should not be based on things. The faith should not be based on the insurance. Rather, our faith should be based on the word of God. Praise the Lord. Another area where people where people live uh, in um, presumption, it's in the way we, in our family relations, Ephesians 5 Ephesians 5 uh, 31 Excuse me, let's Okay, okay, we'll just um, Ephesians 5.31 says For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. This is a great mystery. Um, I think we should read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then we'll just tie the thing together and uh, Okay, let's start from verse 2 Of verse 1 Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me It is good for a man not to touch a woman Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible says a man will leave his father and his mother, he'll be joined to his wife and the two of them will become one flesh. Now, in the area of um, relationships between um, spouses, you know, between spouses, Sometimes we become so so holy or so spiritual or super spiritual that the things which we normally which it's our responsibility towards our spouses we begin to neglect it. We begin to neglect it and you begin to think that it is uh, ordinary. These are not important in the mountain thing. You want to be up there in the mountain and you want to you want to be alone with God. You know, you want to be alone with the Lord and you want to pray. You want to receive revelations and all that. And then you've forgotten that you are still here on earth and that you have an obligation to fulfill towards your spouse. And that's why that place we read in um, Corinthians chapter 7 says, Look. The woman does not have right over her body but the husband. And the husband does not have total right over his body without the wife. And each person should render to his spouse, you know, their due, their due. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Likewise also the wife to her husband. So let us not get super spiritual over spiritual that we begin to think that uh, relating with our spouses it's uh, an ordinary, it's something which we should uh, not engage in. And the Bible says to avoid fornication, 
to avoid adultery, let a man have his own wife and let the woman have her own uh, husband. And the truth is this, my brethren and young people, sex outside marriage is sin. Whether it's fornication, whether it's adultery, it is sin. The only place where sex is allowed is in marriage, when people are married. And when people are married, the wife should not deny the husband her body. And the husband should not deny his wife his body. Each person should render to each other their due affection. So when your spouse is crying for affection and you think that uh, you want to punish the person, as it were in quote, or I will teach you a lesson and you are just opening what? Opening yourself to the devil. And the Bible says, look, we should not give room to the devil. Let us not give a foothold to the devil. Ephesians 5 at 27. We should not give a foothold to the devil. Meaning we should not give opportunity to the devil. And Paul says here, except it's by agreement, you people can decide to stay away from meeting together as husband and wife and then maybe to pray. If after that, then you should come together again. So you don't get so spiritual that you begin to neglect what is your uh, what is your duty towards your spouse? What is your duty towards your spouse? So you don't uh, get to that level when you begin to put all that aside. Uh, so when you do that, you are simply living in a presumption and you could open the door to the devil and anything can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, the young girls are the place where the man walks or other people can tempt your husband and then what you did not expect will happen. Or it could be the other way around. So we need to be careful and then we need to obey the word of God and live by the word of uh, God. Another area in which people show um, living presumption is in finances. Finances in the home situation. Uh, you know, sometimes you see people, brother, that spiritual brother, brother that is high up there and he tells you that, look, he writes a check and he believes that, look, God, we honor the check. My brother, if you don't have money in the bank, don't write check and give any person. Don't believe God that before the man gets to the bank, that money will enter your account. It's, 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 it's deception. It's a lie. It's dishonesty. It's dishonesty. So if you carry such a check to the bank, what happens? It will bounce. And then you will have lost your credibility. You will be a liar. So it is okay you have faith, you are believing God. You can write check and believe God and hold the check until God supplies the money. Then you can release the check. But not that you give a man check and you believe that before he gets to the bank, before he, the, the, money, the check is cashed, you know that money will be in your account. It is presumption. You are just living in, in presumption. Uh, you say you are exercising faith. It's not really faith. Because the evidence has to be based on the word of God. The evidence has to be based on the word of God. So, that is very, very important. Uh, also, uh, this one may relate to the women folks particularly. Now, how do you handle, you know, the house keep money? You know, how do you handle the house keep money? Is it proper that the money that is meant to run the house we take from it, you know, you tie from it, or even tie from it. Is it right without the consent of your husband? If the money is not your money, I don't think it is right. Yes, you may be spiritual. You want to honor God. But that money your husband has given you is for the running of the home. So let it be for that purpose. Let it be for that purpose. If it's your own personal money, and your, 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 you, your, you and your husband have agreed to take this uh, 50,000, use it to do whatever you want to do. This uh, other 100,000 or 60,000 is for food for the house. You can take from your own money and tie it. But when you take money that is meant for feeding, for running the home, and you tie from it, it is dishonesty. It is a sin. 
your husband may not like it and problem could arise in the home. The same thing, you know, also the man, money that is meant for whatever project, don't, don't take from it and use it as offering or use it as a, it's okay, you want to make a pledge and all that. Don't take that money. Let God bless you with money and take, you know, use that money. So it will be wrong. So again, one is living in a presumption. You are living on an assumption and that is not right. If it's your money and it's bad, then use your money to do that. Or the husband and wife will agree. Okay, money has come in. Let us take from this money to you know, to, to pay that, uh, to redeem that vow we made. That is, that is, more, that is decent. And then, uh, you know, there is honesty in that. Praise the Lord. Then uh, another area which you look at in Romans chapter 13 verse 18. Sorry, verse 8. The Bible says, Oh, no man any, let's open to it. Romans 13 verse 8. Oh no one anything except love. Except love one another. Except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. A question I wish to ask is that um, borrowing to meet life's necessity is it sinful? Is it sinful? Is it allowed in Christianity? If we look at the word of God we just read, it says, Oh, no man anything except to do what? To love one another. For love is... For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. You know, love, you know, loving or is fulfilling of the law. So that means that Loving is a continuous debt which I owe you, which you owe me. But if you look at Matthew, Christ says, the person who we borrow from you, don't drive away. You know, in Matthew chapter 5 or, or 6, you know, any person who is going to borrow from you, you know, don't drive away, but you should do what you give him. Lend to him. You know? So, uh, when we put these two scriptures together, is it right for us as Christians to borrow money to meet necessities of life I think where God is taking us to is a situation where we will be able to trust God and believe God for money you know to meet our needs to execute our project but however if you have a place you can get money from the bank or the cooperative, or even you have an individual who can give to you. There is nothing wrong in borrowing. As long as you will pay back, you will do as you have told the people. In the bank, sometimes they make you fill papers. And then they could even ask for collateral. If you have any, you can use your car. If you have a house, you can use your house paper, your C of O as collateral, so that when you default, you are unable to pay then the bank will take over the house, they will auction it, and they will collect their money. But there is actually, you know, I think that God doesn't want us to live, you know, like that. God wants us to be able to trust him, and then he will meet our needs. But borrowing to meet necessities of life is not necessarily a sin. It's not necessarily a sin, but it may not, should not be a lifestyle, you know, so if I have a need and I go to the cooperative, I say, please, I need this money. And the people give me money. And they start taking it even from my salary, so I, from source. So I don't even, it doesn't get to my hand. I have, it has helped me to meet the need. The immediate need. It is not sinful. And it's not against scripture. You know, so it's just an avenue that God has made available for me, but that is not God's ultimate for me. So we must get that right. So in that area, it is not sinful, but it should not be a continuous lifestyle. 
and if you must borrow then be ready to be ready to be ready to pay back and then be somebody who is honest I just make one two points and then we will uh, pray the other area particularly for young people is the area of uh, getting a mate a husband a wife my brother it is good to pray and to believe God to give you a wife, to give you a husband. But it's unscriptural for me to say, ah, this sister, this sister, he not say, this sister, he not say, ah, you will be my wife, you the one, and they are saying, God, ah, that is not right. What if Helen is not ready to marry me? What if Helen is even not ready to marry at all? She's not in her plan. She didn't and then I'm believing God and trusting God and I'm claiming uh, Helene to be my wife that she will be my wife so my brother, the individual is living in a presumption you are living in presumption, you cannot use your faith to override somebody else's will because another person's will is involved so the person must consent, maybe a better way to pray is to pray God, give me a wife give me a husband a husband that will meet, you know, all my physical, emotional needs, both spiritual and and God will give you that person. And when the person comes, even you will know that, ah, this one is the one that God has chosen for me. But to be claiming that uh, uh, brother Charles is the one that uh, will be my husband, and you are praying, and you are believing God. What if Charles is not ready to marry? What if Charles, in fact, his eyes are on somebody else? So let your eyes not be on a, on another, on any person. Honestly, let your eyes not be on any person. But let your eyes be on the word of God. Let your eyes be on the word of God. You know, and God will give you a wife. God will give you a husband. Uh, yes, and uh, in getting a wife or a husband, the things which we normally look for, uh, the person has to be like this. He must, uh, the lady must be 39, 25, uh, 20, and then uh, the, the statistics and all of that. Those things are not too important. Those things are not too important. The man must be like this. He must be tall. He must have broad shoulders. Must, hey. Those things are not like that. Just pray. Let God give you a spouse. Let God give you somebody. So, if you pray like that, it simply means that your faith is not in the word of God but your faith is in uh, that person. So where does uh, the color of the skin uh, how does that one make marriage to be a happy marriage now? And like they say, you know, the beauty is skin deep. So where does uh, the anatomy of the organ of uh, whichever organ you know, how does that one contribute to making marriage a happy marriage? So it is the word of God. Our faith should be on the word of God. Praise the Lord. My time is up. My time is up. So I have to. So, as a final thought, my conclusion of what I will simply say is that let us seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then we can put our claim as it were for whatever it is that we are believing God for. Based on the word of God. And let's leave the red to God. God knows that he will sort out every other thing. That is what I think is the best we should do. We live by the word of God. So the way we avoid presumption is to exercise faith in the word of God. To be ready to obey God. To be ready to believe God. And to believe God even to the very end. When we do that, you know, God will honor his word. Shall we pray? My brother, my sister, we have been talking for quite a while, living in presumption. We have looked at the example of the children of Israel who disobeyed God, and in their presumption, they went up the mountain, and what happened? They were defeated terribly. We saw the case of Samson who lived in disobedience.